everyone. Welcome to another episode of Hello Tetsu. I am your host, Alobo, from the MassCom department. Today, I'm here with a very special guest, Dr. Salikyu, from the political science department. Uh, hello. Uh, <laughs> thank you for having me. It's really nice to, have, to be here today. And I look forward to this um, podcast, really. Uh, in case you're wondering why we have this very special guest with us here today, uh, the thing is, he attended the only invitee conference which was held in China regarding modern philosophy. And uh, in this challenging era, I would say this technologized and the 21st century, uh, sir, do you, what do you have to say regarding this uh, critical thinking and the passive thinking among the young youths? Well, I think... Uh I can't say much of others, but then if I if we were to stick to critical thinking and passive thinking I, in in Nagaland, I think I suppose if we start from here, we find that there's lack of critical thinking. By critical thinking, I mean like just thinking about uh, thinking properly on your own, just not not uh, blindly consuming or accepting whatever is being told to you. Mm -hmm. So if we if we if we understand critical thinking by that definition, then youths in Nagaland are are not critical thinkers. They are mostly passive thinkers. They don't really care about what's happening in their lives. They don't care about what's happening in the society. And hence, in the long run, I mean, right now, it may not matter to the, uh, to the youths themselves. And you may not see the consequences of, of not thinking critically right now. But later on in the future, maybe 10 to 15 years from now, there, there will be a massive negative impact on, on the society, because, precisely because of, of lack of critical thinking among the youths. Through your paper, the uh, modern philosophy, yes. the paper which you wrote, can you please tell us a little bit about the paper? The the paper which I presented in in Beijing last year was it was a philosophical paper uh, about modernity, the concept of modernization. So I l look at uh, modernity from a very philosophical point of view. In other words, like what modernity is in general. So in the paper, what I was arguing was that we have to relook and redefine the term modernity because modernity is a Western concept. The, like what we know of modernity today is a Western concept. And hence, when we speak of modernity and development and progress in general of a society, we tend to view and understand modernity from a very material point of view, such as, you know, we look at, you know, big buildings, having a big car, you know, lots of wealth and lots of all these things. But then modernity itself, if we move away from the Western notion, from the Western uh, uh, philosophical foundation of, uh, of, of the word, and come and move away from it, then we get to understand that modernity itself can be viewed in a very different way, other than, say, for instance, all the material things. So, for instance, we can say that modernity means, in, in a sense, progress. For instance, you growing up is modern itself, or you trying to, I don't know, maybe finding a new way of uh, coming up with understanding your culture itself is modernity. Because usually what happens today is that we define what, what it means to be modern for every society from this Western perspective. Hence, okay. to become modern is to become Western. Do we not? So even in, for example, if we don't even have to look far, if we just look at the example of Nagaland itself, when people in Nagaland speak about modernity, we, we tend to assume this Western mindset. We tend to view modernity from a Western point of view. Okay, it has to be wealth. It has to be prestige. It has to be you know, lots of cars and houses and big, big buildings and big, big roads. Mm -hmm. even, if it costs, even if it means that we have to destroy our land, destroy our forests, destroy the richness of our land, we will do it. Why? Because we want to be modern. We look down upon... We look down upon anything that is not, that is not uh, Western. Look at Nagaland. We are very Westernized. Yes. Our values are Westernized. We don't, but the, the, that's, that's why the, the question that you asked at the beginning is very important. Are we critical thinkers? No, we are not the critical thinkers because we are copy-pasting other people's value into our society. And we are defining ourselves based on the values def given to us from others. We are not coming up with our own indigenous forms of understanding what it means to be modern, what it means to be, the, what it means to be developed. We simply copy paste things. So that was that was my idea about um, the, the thesis about the, the paper I presented. So it was like only invitees, right? The conference. Yes, yes, it was only invitation. Yeah. So, yes. so in the conference, 
the conference was about um, modernization, uh, Chinese style modernization, okay. looking at the global perspective or the philosophical perspective of modernization. And over there, it was only invitation. So there were um, well-known philosophers and thinkers from the United States, from Japan, and from China, mm -hmm. and me, and including me. So yours truly. <laughs> so yeah, that was it. Was it was an honor because I I got to meet. Uh, well-known thinkers and philosophers, which I never thought I'd meet. I met them. I, you know, it was an honor to, to hear them speak, especially even from China. They are, uh, China has now has uh, some of the great philosophical thinkers in the world right now, yes. and even the education system is is way way ahead now. I think it can it can literally challenge uh, the Western uh, education system. Yes. So I think they are. So it was an honor for me to be there, to, even to be invited. So yeah. Mm. Sir, I like heard about this uh, China in their philosophy, the humanism. Yes, yes. Like how they value uh, their families yes, and their yes, societies. Yes. And uh, it is said like though India has like uh, though China has more population than yeah. India, yeah. there are more homeless people in India than in China. Like yeah. so, in your stay in China, did you like notice that or? Uh, the thing is, I stayed in Beijing, so okay. Beijing is the capital, and hence I can uh, because. Beijing is not real China. If you want to see oh. real China, you have to go interior and see okay. the the other provinces in okay. Sichuan or Yunnan or you know or, or you know Fujian, all these things. Then you get an idea about if that's true or not. But then, but as far as I know, whenever I was in Beijing, it was like it was in another world. Like whenever we think of future, right? That's what that's where they were because the whole of Beijing was full of electric cars, electric bikes, electric buses, electric taxis. Everything was very very green green technology and everything was very you know uh, what do you call it everything was so so well organized in a sense the, 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 the way things work so it was very very different so okay. that's why I think that you know China is China is way ahead of many other countries in the world yes. so, yeah so yeah but then to be honest uh, coming back to the issue of uh, about the family issue about Chinese uh, hum humanism it's interesting that uh, that you that you have brought this up because if you look at um, the Chinese humanism, they always, they always try to understand human relation yes. in terms of relationships, which is which I think is very very powerful, and I think which, which I think even uh, which I think even our culture had before, okay. but now I think we have lost it. Yes, yes. Because, like like I said, like I said, I can't come back to the issue. Like because we have we, we are copying some of some people's some cultures yes. ideals, hence we have thrown away in the process of becoming modern and developed we have thrown away those values which we had before I, i'm not sure how to like to, to what extent the issues of family was important i'm sure i'm, I'm quite pre i'm very sure that it was very very important for us but now i think we have lost that and what china is doing now is that they, they have always they have always placed a huge emphasis on relationships in fact it is the longest continuous surviving civilization in the world, the oldest civilization in the world, continuous living, right? For now close to 5,000 years of existence. You can only imagine 5,000 years of existence. And they have been able to exist continuously for the 5,000 years precisely because of the values that they have. If they have lost those values, such as the one that I'm talking about, the relationship, yes. then I'm sure they would not have succeeded. They would, they would not have existed for the 5,000 years that they have. Look at the Western uh, civilization, for instance. If you look at uh, the Greek civilization, it has come to an end. Look at the look at the uh, Roman civilization, it's come to an end. Look at even look at uh, the uh, the Indus Valley civilization. Nobody knows how it vanished, but it vanished. Look at Mesopotamian. Look at the Babylonian. Look at the uh, Assyrian. Look at the Egyptian also. So I'm sure that there must be something. There must be something about the about the culture itself that make, that enables them to survive. Because we talk about, you know, uh, we have this um, from a Darwinian point of view that, you know, that, that human organisms, they survive. They survive because they continue to adapt themselves to the environment, okay. right? So much in the same way, even in culture, you have what makes us survive is the values. And if the values are strong, we can survive. We can survive anything. And that's what the Chinese have been doing. But then it's difficult to say about about us, for instance, for instance, we are already losing our culture. We are already losing our values. Hence, I don't think we, we can we can compare that. So, but the bottom plan says that yeah, they do emphasize a lot on the 
human relation aspects. Mm -hmm. So, like, uh, sir, as a teacher yourself, yeah. like, as a professor, do you think, like, um, it would be, a, like, a very great beneficial if the institutions, they implement all this, um, you know, this philosophical education, for example, let's say, life skill education in their elementaries at a very young age. Do you think, like, the institutions should play roles in implementing these things? Uh, it's, it's a difficult question to answer because <laughs> not because, because because there are lots of practical challenges to it. That's why it's difficult because it's, there's a lot of practical challenges. Otherwise, it's a very good idea because in China, what you find is that I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to, <laughs> to think about China, but then, uh, but then, in China, what happens is that from a very young age, they're given, like yes, you said, yes. they're given this uh, philosophical education from a very young yes. age, and then uh, the, the Chinese philosophy of uh, means relation, right? Okay. It mentions that. A person, a human being, or it's called Ren in China. Human beings is Ren, it's called Ren. So a Ren or a human being, you, you have identity not because of who you are, but because of the relations that you have. Mm. So it's the relations that you have that gives you your identity. And if you have no relations, relations with others, then you have no identity. In other words, I can come back to this, relationship is very, very important because that's a value that holds people together, that holds the whole society together. So. What happens is that the children uh, in, in the Chinese schools, they are taught from a very young age about how to deal with uh, relation, uh, relationship with other people. Whenever you come face to face with problems, whenever you come face to face, not just with problems with, uh, with between your friends, but also with your parents. Sometimes as a children, you may have difficulty with your parents also, but how do you deal, how do you deal with those things? Those things are also, uh, those things are also part of curriculum. So it so from a very young age, they are, they are, uh, the child is imbibed upon this Chinese value yes. that makes them that enhance the sustenance of the culture and civilization itself. So I think you're right in the sense that we should, but how far it is feasible in India or in Nagaland is difficult to say because now the question becomes the, the practicality the, the, the practical challenges becomes if we are to do that in Nagaland, whose philosophy do we use? Do we use the Western philosophy, or do we use the Indian philosophy? Or do we use the Chinese philosophy? Because we have no philosophy of our own. The, the, the sad thing is that. And I think, I, think, I think a culture is important, but to become a civilization, you need philosophy. When I say philosophy, I don't mean just philosophizing. But I mean people coming up with numerous ethical, moral, uh, answering numerous ethical, moral challenges of the society. Right? Anyone who can do that, they are philosophers. So, so... I think we need our own philosophy, I think. And if we can do that, then we can imbibe those values into our children. For instance, we can talk about the relationships, that, the, the importance of family relationships, which our culture used to have. Now, not so much. I mean, it's very obvious. In Nagaland, we don't really care about our own family members. It's very obvious. Some are very, very rich. Some are very, very poor, even from the same family. So we don't really care much of those things. So I think we need to, uh, if we can, I mean, so, so, that, so like I was saying, the challenge becomes whose philosophy are we going to how are we going to inculcate in our children? Western, which is not possible because we are Nagaland. So I think there should be ours, but then we don't have a philosophy. Or nor do we have a value because all our values have changed. The moment we the moment the Nagas converted to Christianity, all our traditional values have changed. So what values do we have to give? We can say we're Christian values, but Christian values are Western values. So we are we're in a huge dilemma. Yes. But sir, I think uh, the Nagaland has like the Na we the Nagas. We have like a very um, unique thing about us, like the diversity. And though there is like so many tribals, we come together as one. And there is acceptance among ourselves. Like for example, even if I'm Sumi, like I just don't go against the other uh, festivals for like the Angami tribes festivals. I mean, there's the beauty in Nagaland. So I think I disagree with you. I disagree because in Nagaland there's no unity. It's really? very obvious. It's very obvious. For example, if you don't say anything against others, other types, it's not because, not because you are accepting of others, but because you don't want others to criticize your group. Okay. Most people do that because of that. Simple reason. It's not because we are accepting of others, because we are not. Because we are very, very... We think that... Uh, people in Nagaland do think that we are very, very open, we are very diverse. We are right, we are very diverse. But then, are we accepting of the diversity? No. We are not. It is you, you can see this tension being played out in the way, for
for instance, even the newspapers, you can just read the newspapers and you'll find the newspapers is covered with felicitations. Yeah. That's a manifestation of challenges and uh, that's a manifestation of tension between tribes. It's like trying to show off who, which tribe is better. Like, oh, my tribe is doing this, my clan is doing this. It's just a competition, a very toxic competition. It's not a good competition. It's a very toxic competition. It's very plain to see. Just, just, just the felicitation in the newspaper is an example that we are not united, that we are not accepting of others. Right now, you have uh, so many problems uh, with regards to uh, all over Nagaland. Right now, there's, uh, there's uh, problems going on between the, uh, the Maos and the Angamis. Previously, you had the Sumis and the Zeliangs. And then now you're even in the eastern also between the Sumis and the Easterns. And again, you have so many problems in Nagaland between tribes. So no, it, it, there's, 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 not, there's no unity. And we're not accepting of others. We, are not, we don't. We try to be better than other tribes. That's it. So do you think like because of the existence of tribalisms among ourselves, do you think it's uh, the Nagaland arts that is unfit for the title Nagaland for Christ? <laughs> 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 I mean, I mean, like our motto, our that motto, we have this Nagaland for Christ. But like you say, the existence of, you know, let's say the existence of tribalism and the fact that even if it's called Nagaland for Christ, they there are more Catholic schools than Christian schools. <laughs> uh, I think so. I no. The thing is, that's very. I think that's a very good point because, and you have to ask that question, right? I mean. Are we even worthy to call Nagaland uh, Nagaland for Christ thing? Because if Nagaland is for Christ, then your tribe should not matter. Yes. We're all Christians. That should be enough to bring us together, right? Yes. That should be enough for us to rise above our, our communities, our clan, our tribe, our village, whatnot. But we are not. We have our own every tribe has their own churches. Every in fact, you know, if you go to some some uh, uh, some villages, they'll have their own even in the same village, they'll have two three two three uh, churches based on different clans or whatnot. So even religion itself is not enough to bring us together. So, so now you see how problematic this is. I'm not saying that tribe is bad. Yes. I'm not saying tribe is bad. I'm not, I'm not saying that. It's good. But then we should not make it into toxic. We should not make tribes a toxic problem in our land. Yes, yes. And we do that by, by our fight for resources. We fight over... All the tribes are fighting over resources in our land. In other words, the resources is what? The government jobs. Everyone wants access to that. Hence, the competition is very intense and very toxic. We are willing to we are willing to do whatever we can, whatever means we can, in order to ensure that if I'm the minister of if I'm the minister of whatever department, that department will be filled by my community. All these things, it's there. I'm not saying that like it, it happens every time. I'm not saying it's happening only now. It has been happening since the formation of the state of Nagaland. It's happening now, and to be honest, it'll get worse in the future. So yeah, so in a sense you're right. I mean, we are not. I I think we are kind of. We have to question the very we are fit to be called Naga for uh, Nagaland for Christ. And do you appreciate the beauty of existence, the beauty of diversity in this college? Like, uh, we have so many students from other students during the first week of the month, every first yes, week yes. of the month. So like, does it like lights you up like? happy that like even if it even if the adults or like even if the uh, older generations have these tribalisms among them the youngsters they come together as one and they're accepting each other i don't know whether i i appreciate what the college is trying to do i appreciate the diversity of our college i really do but then as to the question of whether you know the youngsters are, are putting on their traditional small small pieces of the traditional attires and coming to colleges it's nice it's sweet but whether we can take that as a sign that the younger generations are less tribal than their elders, that is difficult to say because who knows? That's why I said the future is more, uh, that's why I'm saying that in the future, tribalism will get more intense because jobs will be less. And when jobs are less, what do we do? We, we go back to our tribe. Our tribe, our community becomes, our tribe, our community becomes the, becomes the support we need in order to get a job. So, so as because the thing is, the population is growing, right? Yes. As the population grows, government job uh, is bound to be less because it's not possible. It is like we have to understand that no government in the world, no matter how rich, can ever give government jobs to all its population. It's not possible. Even in a communist country like the Soviet Union before, 
even they could not do it. How can a, a liberal society or a liberal country like India or in, uh, India and Nagaland, how can the government provide all the jobs for, for everybody, jobs for everybody? It's not possible. And as population increases, job become, becomes less. What do we do? Competition becomes more intense. Then the shortest way of getting a job is to fall back to the group. Yes, but I think with modernity and then, like, there, uh, as of now, we can see not by, uh, even today, even today, we can notice that there are so many youngsters who have created their own path for themselves. Yes, yes, they like, have. Even yes. if it's not a government job, they have, they're like, based on their skills, even though they don't have all these qualifications and you're degrees. You're right. Yes, exactly, you're so, right. I don't think it's, like, unnecessary to keep on fighting for government jobs. Why not? go for some jobs that is like you're capable of and you can make your own no, that's, no, you bring up a very good point and you're right because there are some people, there are some youths, youngsters who have made your own, own uh, they have, who have made your own uh, choice to go outside, go outside of the government job arena. So that's very good and they're doing, they're doing quite well, that's very good. But then, mm -hmm. like how many of them are doing it? If you look from the total population, just simple mathematical, mathematics, from the total population, if, if, Nagaland has around 20 lakhs. You know, that's a questionable um, uh, figure, but then we say this, let's assume that Nagaland has 20 lakhs. From the, even if you say that 1,000 or 10,000 youths have gone away from there, from the, and they have created their own whatnot platforms, that amounts to very little from the total population. You can point, right? So we cannot look at this simple, this small minority and say that, ah, we cannot take this small minority and generalize it for the whole population. That would be wrong. Can my point? Yes, yes. But you see? I, I but, but, because you're right. Yeah, what <laughs> I'm saying is like, like yes, no, you're right. I mean, I know you're you are being very optimistic. I hope I can be like you, but I'm optimistic, <laughs> but I'm not a very optimistic person. But yes, you're right. I mean, I hope, I, I, I do stand to be corrected. I do hope that I'm wrong in, all, in most of my estimation about the Naga society and whatnot. But, uh, but yeah, but I do, uh, I have to be hopeful, right? But, yeah, but, yeah, so, yeah, it's, it's a difficult thing. But then, nevertheless, yes, you're right. Uh, there are some youths who have uh, created their own platforms, um, but uh, but still, I think our society still have a long way to go. I think in terms yes. of, I think um, the step that the youngsters they can take, like speaking of me myself, yeah. reflecting upon myself, I think um, we should engage more in these social interactions instead of just being occupied on our gadgets and inside our room. I think um, we should. Do you think like the youngsters should get in get, like involve themselves, you know, with uh, the older generations? Say, for example, our Naga traditions, our stories, our folklore. Yes, yes. It's all oral. They yes, are yes. hardly written. That's the beauty of it. Yes. So, like, do you think? Do you will you appreciate the youngsters to go out of their rooms and have a listen to those stories in order to keep the um, their ethnicity, their culture alive? Yes, you're right. I mean, that, that too, I, I would full heartedly support and encourage you to, to do that. Because I think uh, one of the beauty of our cultures is the orality. In other words, the, his, the, the, the values, the traditions, all are passed on through orality. And there's something special about, about, about stories which are being passed on through orally. Because it's not written down, hence it makes it even more special. Right? Because you have to kind of remember, because it, it tells us that uh, maybe because, because, because of our oral, oral culture, I think Nagas are very smart. We are very smart. Nagas are very... I'm not trying to underestimate Nagas. <laughs> they are very smart in bad things also, but, in, but <laughs> I think we use our smartness in bad ways more often than good ways. I think that's the problem, I think. But we are very smart because orality requires... Whenever I pass on a story from me to you, you have to remember exactly what I'm saying. I'm, of course, there are some people who argue that, ah, you cannot remember. But then you also have to understand that maybe there, there, there existed in the past where when people were much smarter than us today. And they were. Hence, you have to remember whatever I'm saying clearly to, the, to its precision, right? That means our culture, the, our people were quite smart. Yes. You see, you point, right? But then we tend to lose that. We tend to, we tend to value less because now we put more emphasis on writing. Because once you put, once you put, uh, once you bring in the, the written culture, the importance of orality goes away. And if the importance of or orality goes away, then the importance of smartness also goes away. And that's why we, and that's why what we see now in Naga culture is, we, we tend to like, we don't we don't think we are not smart anymore like we used to be. 
So that's why no wonder the, the British had a difficult time dealing with the Nagas precisely because we were quite smart for them. It was, it, was a, it was a piece of cake for them to conquer India, but it was difficult for, for them to conquer us. Why? Because we were quite smart, because we still had this, all these traditional practices and whatnot. It's only when we converted ourselves to Christianity that we lost that way, those ways. The, our, because I think the moment you... you I think the, most youths need to start cautioning our transition to Christianity. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that Christianity is bad. It's good. It's very good. But then we, we must also accept the fact that by accepting Christianity, we lost our culture. That we cannot, we, that we cannot deny. And hence, with the coming of Christianity, we started with emphasis on writing. With the coming of emphasis on writing, we, we, we forgot, we tend to underplay the importance of passing on our values through orally. I still remember that my grandmother used to uh, tell me when I was young about uh, oral stories, right? Which I still remember. Not as clearly as when I stayed, but then I still remember some of the stories. So now, those are some, like, values right you passed on values like that and then to understand the uh, to understand uh, the, the story which my grandmother told me for instance for example or you for example or your, or, your, or your parents for example to understand that you can't understand the the moral of the story literally right that required a lot of thinking you know what i mean right yes and because we are and now that we have lost that we have lost that 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 thinking part hence people in nagaland don't think we have lost, coming back to the, to the question that you started with, we have lost the, 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 the ability to think critically. And that's very sad because now we, we, undermine, we are undermining our own culture. And that's why I support that you go and I support the youth to go and listen to the old traditional culture stories and whatnot. But then again, uh, my doubts, but then again, it's good, but I don't encourage writing it down because the moment you write it down, the meaning is lost. The, the, the meaning, the, the profound meaning and significance of the story is lost. So, that's, that's my opinion. I may be wrong. You know, yeah. I may be wrong. But. No, like I'm like questioning myself. Oh, good, you have the question um, a lot. You say like writing is like against, you're against the writing of this. But then I feel like if we write, even if, like, for say, for instance, I'm writing a folklore that I uh, heard from my grandpa, mm. and I'm in my bed, but yeah. I'm about to die. Yeah. And I don't have kids to tell, or yeah. my mm, siblings, or my parents to tell. Mm. I'm an orphan. Mm. Uh, but I'm in my bed, but I have a diary and a pen. Yeah, yeah. That's all. And I'm writing the oral, yeah. the story which I've heard from my grandparents. So even if I'm dead, the thing is written. So... It can be passed on. I tell you one thing. This is this. Is, uh, this is the best way to understand it. I know what you're trying to say, but that's not how to how to, that's, that's not a very good excuse. When you live in a society where you have to write down, people make lots of uh, good justification that we have to uh, preserve our culture, and the only way to preserve our culture is to write it down, to write down the stories, but not okay. Fine, I agree with that. But then, for me personally, I don't agree with that. Because it says a lot. Number one, if I can write it down, that means it's there, hence the importance, the meaning of the story is lost. I'll tell you why it's lost. It's because if you have a piece of book, right, you don't necessarily have to read it, right? Because it's there, you take it for granted. You get my point? Because the story is already there and written it down, you take it for granted. It's there, but it becomes like whenever you go past uh, some small shop, you see a lot of candy, right? Sweets. But do you even give a second look? No, right? Because it's just there, right? Mm -hmm. So you know you'll be there today, tomorrow, day after tomorrow. You take it for granted. You don't value it anymore, right? However, whenever you pass down the old stories or the values from true orally, right? That means it ensures that everybody learns it. Mm. If everybody learns it, it's there in their very soul. And it is passed on to the next generation, to the next generation. That means the importance and the significance of the stories are there because it'll be because because we know that when you realize that in your life, if I lose this, everything is gone, right? That's why, because you don't want to lose it, you try to make sure that you preserve it in any. You, you you try even harder to make sure that you don't lose it. 
instead of this handwritten thing, oh. will you suggest audio recording? <laughs> <laughs> or really, since you say, or really, <laughs> will so, you suggest so recording myself? Is, whenever, once I realize that I cannot, I can no longer write it, right? Okay. Then I will try my very best not to forget it. And if I don't forget it, I leave it. I leave the value. Oh. Get my point, right? I leave the value. Because I don't want to forget it, and hence I pass it down to the next, to the next, and then the, the culture flourishes. But once the moment you write it down, it's there, hence, if you want, you can just read it. It's there. Okay. So, but you see, the critical thinking is not there. So you, you have started with a very good point. Yes, because we like critical thinking, we just assume that whatever the whole world is doing, we should follow it. That's why we're doing it right now. That's why we put lots of emphasis right now in Nagaland. There's a lot, a lot of emphasis on writing down our oral culture. It's good, but on the other hand, it tells me. On the other hand, it shows me that people don't really care about the culture. That's why you write it down. Because we are too busy with other things. We don't leave the values. So, like, even if the... You were talking about that. Yeah, let me just uh, let me just jump in here. You were talking about the, about the Chinese value, right? About, yes, yes. I'll tell you why they've been flourishing for 5,000 years. It's because they leave the value. Yes. So, uh, what you can... Uh, what I can learn from your uh, saying is that if I learn a um, culture that is written, I have not only read it but also leave that value. If you've read, yeah, it's 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 good to just leave the value, right? But once you write it down, it's difficult to leave the value because have you read Bible? Yes. Do you leave the value? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> I hope it's not for the sake of. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. See, but, but see, that's the thing. Once you write it down, most people, for just like the example of Bible, many people read Bible, but do they actually leave the value in the Bible? They don't. True. That is interesting. So if you if you come across a written culture and the value, you have to like not only just blindly read it, but implement it and leave it. Yeah, but it's more difficult whenever you have written down history, written down uh, values, because people are. People don't take it. People don't value it. If you don't value it, you don't leave it, right? You just throw it away, right? I, I'm sure, like, uh, just like the, just like the, the example of the of the of the candy store. Whenever you go past some small shop, lots of sweets are there, but you just don't even look at. It's there, you know, but then you just go past it, right? There's no urge to turn and just look at it, get a glimpse of the sweets. You don't do that. Nor do you value it. But some things. But in life, I mean, this is quite true in all of our lives. If you know that this is the only thing, this is very, very precious, and you don't want to lose it, you try very, you try your best to make sure that you preserve it and you protect it because it's very easily lost. Yes. But something which is easily replaceable, you don't value it. That's why you can write it down, right? You can write it down, but then it can be replaceable, right? Somebody can write it again, right? If I make 10, 20, 30, 40 copies of the same story, then one can be torn away, it's fine, I have th I have uh, 19 more. One can be torn, you know what I mean, right? You don't value it anymore. It's like that. So what would you suggest us to do? Like, to keep the culture alive, to keep the value alive? If you know of stories, if you know of uh, those, old, those old folklores and the values and the morals which they are trying to tell us, leave it. If once you leave it, you will remember the stories and you can pass it down to your children, to your grandchildren, all these things. And then the culture will live on like that. So can you like, uh, in conclusion of our podcast today, can you tell us like, uh, what were you thinking when you, uh, like what, what came across your mind when you were writing the paper Modern Philosophy? Uh, I, it's, I don't know how to put it into words, but Cautioning, because we have to caution everything. Whenever something says, whenever people say, here, this is good for you, you caution, why is this good? So that's why I started with modernity. Why? Because my interest came from uh, people of Nagaland obsession with modernity. People in Nagaland are very, very obsessed with modern things. When I say modern things, I mean literally big house, big land, like everything material, everything superficial, we got it from outside. We've lost our honesty, our sincerity, our courage. We have lost courage. 
very, very few people in Nagaland who are courageous, truly courageous. Many people are just courageous outwardly. That's why, that's why you see the, the you, that's why you see the trend of gym, right? All the gym in Nagaland is because they are trying to mask their cowardness by trying to build up physically because they are cowards. Nagas were thin, we're small, but we were strong inside. We are courageous inside. Now we have, we have lost that courage. Hence, we are trying to mask our cowardness with physical uh, building up of you know abnormally large uh, bodies, which is kind of you know weird. Oh, it's, it's really different. Like as a youngster, like I feel like building these muscles and these things are nothing related to covering up our cowardness. That's I why. Have, I have that's to why you have to, that, that. That's why critical thinking is important. You have to think. You have to start thinking. Why? Why is there obsession, Nagas? Why? Why do we obsess with beauty? How many beauty pageants do we have in Nagaland every year? And now we have started. Not only that, now we have started with the obsession with gym. Building up for the what? Are we trying to hide something? Are we trying to mask something? Critical thinking. That's right. Question. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it was really nice. Yeah. Well, it was really uh, good. Yeah. It was like, if you guys are looking forward to more of this content where uh, we can have a conversation with a professor and a student, I'll make sure that uh, we'll try to make sure that we'll bring you more, mm, not just a conversation, but an in depth discussion so do do leave your suggestions and yes as sir said just because we're free does not mean we have to stop thinking uh, what is given to us i hope and believe that through this um the, through this talk through this conversation the nagas not only the nagas but every youngsters out there will start questioning themselves what is given to them what they see how they're living their life and may you be the better person you were yesterday. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you.